So now we have our very first spotlight session of the night. This is where we invite people whose work we admire and then we punish them by asking them three questions in seven minutes. So it's very much a high speed, high stakes game, but I couldn't be more delighted to be sitting here with Astra Taylor. Many of you know her. She's an author, she's a documentary maker, she's the co-founder of The Debt Collective. She also has a new film called What is Democracy? It's opening in the US in January. Yes, I in January, just around the corner. Um, and she also coined, I think it's a really useful term called photomation in an essay in Logic magazine. So I thought we might start there and ask you, what is photomation and, and how do you find the faux in AI? Yes, we have to be clear that it's F-A-U-X. Right? Yes, faux in the French way. Photomation. Um, so, you know, I, I have been writing and thinking about technology issues and um, economic inequality through my work uh, organizing, so thinking about labor, thinking about debt. Um, and so I wanted to come up with a term that would name this process, right? The fact that so much of what passes for automation isn't really automation. And so I think we can, um, you know, I'll give a little definition, which is photomation is the process that renders invisible human labor to maintain the illusion that machines and systems are smarter than they are. Mm -hmm. So you, you gave some great examples already in your introduction, right? We can think about all the content moderators and digital janitors who are cleaning the internet and making it a, a space that we actually want to be in. Um, you know, they're egregiously underpaid. They often work um, overseas. You know, we can of course think of Amazon Mechanical Turk and their kind of cheeky slogan. They kind of admit it, right? With artificial, artificial intelligence. Yeah. But the same labor issues are at play. I mean, there's a, frequently there are articles exposing the fact that your digital assistant that you thought was a bot was ac is actually a terribly underpaid human being doing a mind-numbing task. Yep. So it's everywhere. And the moment that sort of tipped me over the edge and helped me name this phenomenon, I was standing in line ordering my lunch and I had talked to the human being and I had paid them cash. But this man was in front of me clutching his phone and he just was awestruck and he said, how did the app know that my order was done 20 minutes early? And, and the girl looked at him and she was just like, I sent you a message. <laughs> and it was the, it was the man's, it, it was the, he was so willing to believe that it was a robot. You know, he was so willing to believe that this all seeing artificially intelligent system was overseeing his organic rice bowl. You know, <laughs> that he, he, couldn't, he couldn't see the labor, the human labor, right in front of his eyes. And we do that all the time because we're not curious about the process. We're, not, we're, not, we're so ready to devalue and underestimate the human contribution. And I think that's really dangerous. So, I mean, where is this coming from? I mean, who really has the most to gain from this kind of mythic building up of perfect automated systems? So, you know, automation is a reality, you know. It happens. It happens, <laughs> but it's also an ideology. And so the point is to separate those two things, right? Mm -hmm. to, to be very sort of upfront when the ideological component is coming into play. So who benefits? The bosses benefit. So, you know, I open the piece by saying, you know, somewhere right now, an employer is saying to a broke, exhausted underling, someone or something is willing to do your job for free, yeah. right? So this idea that, of sort of inevitable human obsolescence you know, helps employers. And I found the perfect villain in Ed Renzi, who was the CEO of McDonald's, who was so angry at the Fight for 15 movement. And he, you know, helped take out an ad in the Wall Street Journal, and he wrote op-eds for Forbes, and he was basically like, if you people ask for $15, the robots are gonna replace you. And then he wrote another piece a few months later, it was like, it's happened. And he, he sort of cried some crocodile tears. Um, but, you know, when you watch this video that he was promoting of, you know, how these troublesome workers had been done away with, what you see is not anything we should dignify with the term automation. It was just customers doing the work for free, inputting their orders into iPads. Yep. You know, so like, that's not automation. <laughs> New York Airport. Every right? time you want to buy something, exactly. you'll be doing it. Right? This is, this is automation. And so I think we need to replace this, you know, we're always like, robots are taking our jobs. And so I make less catchy but more accurate slogan is, you know, capitalists are making targeted investments in robots <laughs> to weaken workers and replace them. Pretty good. I think, I think we'll give that a thumbs up. It's, um, it's less catchy, but it's, it's more. It's not catchy. It, if somebody can make that catchy, yeah, let then we can co-brand the revolution, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Like, exactly. Yeah. One of the things 
things I really love about the work that you have done for so long, but particularly in this essay, is that you really walk us through the history of automation, but in particular, the sort of the feminist history of domestic labor. Tell me what we can learn from those histories. Yes. So, you know, I think we, we're led astray when we look to science fiction sometimes, right? We see this, this robot future where everything is done for us. And I'm saying, you know, instead of looking at that, um, the people who can kind of give us insight are actually socialist feminists. Because women have a long history of being sold domestic technologies. There's a great book called More Work for Mother about how these labor-saving devices actually just sort of uh, ramped up the cult of domestic uh, cleanliness, you know, and these tools actually created more and more work. But it's, it's a deeper insight. They offer a deeper insight than that. And the socialist feminists, they're, they're wrestling with the question of, like, what is work, right? And they're observing the fact that capitalism sort of grows and sustains itself by concealing work and not paying for as much of it as possible. Yep. You know, they don't want to pay. For, <laughs> capitalists don't want to pay the full value of work. And so you can picture two assembly lines. One is like the assembly line of a factory or the coffee shop you're going to where you're involved in monetary exchanges. And the underlying assembly line is all the work that is done to reproduce daily life and to make the workers who could then work those jobs for wages. So women have always been told their work doesn't matter and that it doesn't deserve a wage, right? Because it's uncompensated. And so I think you know, they, there's something there for us, right? As we're told that there's going to be this future where we're, where we're, you know, where there's no work for humans to do. And this insight was really made palpable to me. I was in a lecture given by Sylvia Federici, who's this amazing scholar, who's also features very prominently in my my film, What Is Democracy? And this grad student, you know, we were talking about she was talking about reproductive labor and the value of it. And this grad student very earnestly said, "Okay, but but aren't we heading to a future where there will be no jobs?" you know, and sort of conjured Marx's reserve army of labor and this image that we would just all be sitting there like with nothing to do, you know, just on the margins. And Sylvia's response was really bracing and she just said, don't let them convince you that you're disposable, mm. right? This, don't let, don't believe it. Don't believe that, um, that message. And, you know, I think that there's a really valuable point there because if the, if the automated, um, day of judgment were really nigh, they wouldn't have to invent all of these apps to fake it. <laughs> <laughs> As you would imagine. I want to point out that not only did you manage to arc from McDonald's to Sylvia Federici, but you did it in exactly seven minutes. So can we please... <laughs> Next up, we have our panel on inequality Politics of Austerity and AI. And it's going to be chaired by Vincent Sutherland of NYU. Please welcome him and our panelists.